Webb sees weather on an exoplanet and takes a new image of the Horsehead Nebula. A satellite sees close up image of space debris and Hubble goes into safe mode and out again. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. So what's the weather on an exoplanet? Well, Webb can tell you now. So of course, the mighty James Webb Space Telescope is able to directly image exoplanets orbiting around other stars. And this time, it turned its eye on an exoplanet called WASP-43b. And this is a hot Jupiter, it orbits its star at 1 25th the distance from the sun to Mercury, so incredibly close to its star. And it is so close to the star that it is tidally locked to the star. In other words, it always shows one face to the star and one face away from the star. So what does this do to the weather on this planet? What Webb was able to measure was that it had thick clouds on the night side of the planet and relatively clear skies on the day side of the planet. Like this is madness that Webb is able to measure like to actually see the weather on an exoplanet. And even crazier, you've got these high velocity winds going 8000 kilometers per hour that are shifting from the day side to the night side. Of course, you've got these extreme temperature differences between the two sides of the planet. And so you've got these really, really powerful winds. So like this planet looks nothing like anything we have in the solar system, even though it is a gas giant, it is Jupiter like, it would look dramatically different than Jupiter if we could actually look at it close up. This weather forecast gives us a bit of an understanding of like, what are the implications of tidally locked exoplanets, maybe around red dwarf stars that maybe could be more habitable. And we know that the planets around the Trappist one system are likely tidally locked to their star. And so to see the weather forecast on a hot Jupiter that is tidally locked, this gives some implications about what we might see on other planets orbiting around red dwarf stars. Now I did an interview about the possibilities of atmospheres on planets around red dwarf stars. So I think it's sort of really good timing. So definitely check out that interview if you want. Webb goes into interferometry mode to see two portal planets. One of the most studied protoplanetary systems is called PDS 70. I have like, like history with this system, I gave a series of talks and I was showing images of PDS 70, where you can see the central star and just this really distinct protoplanetary disk around it. And since then, astronomers have come to know that there are two newly forming planets within this system. And so let's bring Webb to the task to see how well it's able to image those planets. It used one of its instruments called the Near Infrared Imager and Slitless Spectrograph or NEARUS, but specifically it used a certain mode in NEARUS called the Aperture Masking Interferometry Mode. And this gives it super high resolution when it's trying to image very small objects, try to pick out distinct details, it's able to use this mode of the nearest instrument. And it was easily able to locate the two known planets PDS 70 B and C. And in fact, it also found a third source of light in the system. So this could be a third planet or an even more exotic possibility is that there's like this gas and dust that is feeding down into this protoplanetary disk. And this is actually giving off additional heat that Webb is able to see. So this could be like another planet in formation. It's pretty amazing what we can see for a planetary system that is 366 light years away. One step closer to space debris removal. All right, this picture is blowing my mind. Take a look at it. You are looking at the upper stage of a Japanese rocket, a piece of space junk, space debris. And this image was taken by the active debris removal by Astroscale Japan mission or Address J. And this mission was launched several months ago. And its goal is to track down this very specific piece of space debris, get within a couple of 100 meters, take a bunch of pictures, move to another position, match rotation, match orbit, and study the space debris from a distance. And so you're looking at the picture that it took of the space debris. Now, obviously, space debris is a big problem. You know, there are more and more chunks in space spent upper stages of rockets, things like that. 
And so if there's a way to actually remove this space debris, then we can reduce the possibilities of satellites getting destroyed by space debris running into it. And so the first step is to just understand how the space debris behaves. And then future missions can actually try to grapple with the space debris, deploy some kind of drogue shoot, and be able to bring it back down and have it re enter the Earth's atmosphere. So this is like the first step in tackling this problem of dealing with space debris. Hubble had problems with its gyros, but it's back again. All right, first the bad news. The Hubble Space Telescope had a problem with one of its three remaining gyros. And based on that, NASA put it into safe mode. And so it had to stop doing its science operations. Now the gyros, these are these fairly large spinning wheels on board the spacecraft that allow it to maintain its targeting perfectly so that it can track some object in space with precision to be able to do these long exposure images that Hubble needs to do to do its science. It started with six of these gyros, and then they fail for various reasons. And over the decades, the various Hubble servicing missions have flown up and have replaced the gyros. And most recently, in 2009, they replaced all six gyros with brand new ones. And already, the telescope is down to three. Now it wants three, but it can get by with two researchers have figured out how to use other instruments on board combined with two gyros to be able to have it still maintain its targeting. If it goes below two, we've got some problems. And so when NASA saw that it was having problems with one of its gyros, put into safe mode, stop the science operations, get to the bottom of the problem. The good news is that then they were able to deal with the problem, get it back operational, and it's doing science again. I'm going to rant more about the Hubble Space Telescope and gyros and reaction wheels at the end of this episode. So stick around for that. Black holes can kill star formation in galaxies. Think about the super massive black hole at the heart of a galaxy. And you sort of imagine this swirling vortex that is sucking in all the material of the galaxy. And that is not true. Yeah, if you get too close to a supermassive black hole, you're going to go in material does swirl around in an accretion disk, but supermassive black holes, despite their supermassiveness really only account for like less than 1% of the mass of the galaxy, they're insignificant. But it turns out that they do have an outsized impact on giant galaxies. So when a supermassive black hole is actively feeding on material, it gets this accretion disk it has these powerful magnetic fields that are swirling around the black hole. And then it gets these jets that form that are outflowing gas along the poles of the supermassive black hole and you get this outflow of gas throughout the galaxy. And new observations from James Webb have shown that these outflows can actually act like a wind that clears out the gas and dust that is needed for star formation within a galaxy. And so when one of these black holes is pushing for long enough, it can actually starve the star forming regions of material and halt the star formation in the galaxy, clearing out all the raw material for future stars. And so the whole galaxy will then cease mostly its star formation. And then all the stars will just get older and die. And so it turns out that this is a genuine risk for galaxies in the early universe. Every week, we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best story of the week. And last week, the top story was that Voyager one is fixed. It was closely followed by NASA greenlighting the Titan Dragonfly. And I think a lot of people were pretty mad that they had to choose between those two choices. So uh, thank you everybody who voted. We post this vote onto our uh, YouTube channel into the community tab within about 24 hours of when we release this video. So you can vote for the story that you thought was the best. And of course, the best chance to see this is to subscribe to our channel, click on the notifications bell, watch a bunch of our videos, and then that will tell YouTube that you want our content showing up in your YouTube feed. Slim survives another lunar night. Well, the Japanese Slim Lander survived again. <laughs> again. <laughs> Again! <laughs> Again! This is like the third lunar night that this lander has been able to survive, but it is still upside down. And so when it reaches lunar day, 
its solar panels are in shade still. It's only near the end of the lunar day that sunlight finally makes it onto the solar panels, powers up the spacecraft, it's able to take a couple of pictures, send some messages home, and then it goes into shadow again and has to survive another lunar night. I don't know, it's like hell or something, but still, it's amazing that this spacecraft has been able to survive for three of these lunar nights. This event kills most spacecraft, and yet Slim it just keeps going and going. Imagine if it landed right side up. Now let's look at some amazing images. The first is an image from the European Chinese collaboration called the Einstein probe. And this is an x ray telescope. It's designed to scan a large region of the sky looking for transient x ray events. So flashes coming from neutron stars, white dwarfs, supernova, things that are short period in the x ray spectrum, and then other X-ray telescopes can target and do more long duration imaging of the event. It's first light time. I really love first light. This is that that first picture that you get from a brand new telescope. And in this case, the people working with the Einstein probe decided they were going to take an image of a supernova remnant called Puppis A. And this is a supernova that went off about 4000 years ago. This is the expanding cloud of gas and dust that was released by the star as it was dying. And then when the supernova went off, this shock wave goes through the material, heating it up and blazing in the x ray spectrum. And if you look carefully at the image at the very center, you can see this bright dot. And that is the neutron star, the leftover remnant from the star that went supernova. And the next image is a very familiar object. This is the Horsehead Nebula. And like you've probably seen the very famous iconic image of the Horsehead Nebula from the Hubble Space Telescope it really looks like a chess piece, like a knight in chess. And to go along with this image release, we got sort of three different versions of the Horsehead Nebula. The first one is from the Euclid mission, which is you know, helping map dark matter and dark energy across the universe. And then the second image comes from the Hubble Space Telescope looking at the Horsehead Nebula in the infrared spectrum. And the third image is from Webb. And because Webb has this really tiny field of view, you're really just looking at this little chunk of the mane of the Horsehead. And yet, at that level of detail, you can just see the swirling clouds of gas and dust in the area. They're heated up by nearby bright stars that are releasing radiation into the region. And if you look really closely, you can actually see background galaxies in the image. So another of the big targets checked off for James Webb. I love the Horsehead Nebula. It's one of those images that, that backyard astronomers with with a telescope and a camera can take an image of. It's so cool. Now you're watching a video version of Space News. But of course, I write a weekly email newsletter, I manage a busy space news website called Universe Today. And so every week I write an email version of our website and I send out to about 70,000 of my closest friends. The thing is completely free. I write every word in it. There's no ads. You can just sign up, unsubscribe, whatever. But we cover a lot of stories in the newsletter that you're not going to see here on Space Bites. For example, how knot theory can help spacecraft change their orbits without using propellant. How binary stars can form in the same nebula and yet they're not identical and evidence for the Earth's magnetosphere 3.7 billion years ago. So go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up to our weekly newsletter. I'm going to talk some more about the Hubble Space Telescope. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Dennis Alberti, Dougie Stewart, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Mark Ansius, Modso, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. The Hubble Space Telescope just celebrated its 34th anniversary, taking just incredible images of the night sky. And yet some of the most amazing rescues in space missions have happened to the Hubble Space Telescope. When Hubble was first launched, it had blurry vision. So the first images that were coming back from the telescope, they just looked blurry and astronomers realized that the mirror hadn't been ground correctly. And when the space shuttle went up and the astronauts brought a pair of glasses, corrective lenses 
for the Hubble Space Telescope, it was able to get that perfect precision sharpness that they wanted. But the next thing that failed on the Hubble Space Telescope were the gyros, these giant spinning wheels that keep it focused on target. And it has gone through so many gyros in those 34 years of, of operation. And they've been swapped out and replaced and swapped and replaced. And now we're down to three, but you saw one had some problems. So we were down to two, and they were able to get back operational We're back to three. But eventually we will be down to two. And then we'll be down to one. And it's able to work with two, one is pretty tricky. And so Although this is a false alarm, you should prepare yourself emotionally for the possibility that at some point, Hubble's going to lose those final gyros, and then it will no longer be able to do its science operations. There might be some good news. Polaris is proposing a mission where they can send a team of astronauts on a Dragon capsule to perform another Hubble servicing mission. If they do that, they can bring up a new set of gyros, swap them all out, and then that'll give the spacecraft another 10 years of life before those gyros start to fail. So, uh, Let's hope that that mission actually goes because like Hubble is completely oversubscribed. People line up to use this telescope, even though it has been operational for 34 years, it is old and yet so powerful and so necessary for science. All right, we'll see you next week.